Well, good morning, everybody. It's about 731. We've got uh, several people still joining us, but I'll kind of go ahead and kick it off. Uh, my name is Sarah Carlson. I'm Strategic Initiatives Director with Practical Farmers of Iowa. I think many of you know uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa is a member, farmer member organization here in Iowa. We also work in surrounding states. Um, and we've been working a bunch on cover crops, um, but also just general uh, support uh, for farmers, you know, in what's been going on uh, these past couple of weeks with the derecho uh, storm damage. Um, we've been lucky enough to been working also with partners like NRCS and IDOLS and other organizations to pull together a team today to hopefully get a bunch of questions answered about what your next plan should be for those crops that are damaged. Um, what maybe some good ideas on how to still make cover crops work in that system uh, might be. And hopefully we can just, you know, feel a bit better about the path forward over these next several months um, as we deal with this unfortunate uh, large storm that we, we've just had. So uh, with me today is Rebecca Clay uh, from Practical Farmers of Iowa. She's behind the scenes uh, running the show. Becky, you might want to wave. I think your camera's on. Um, so we're going to try to make this really interactive, uh, which means that we need some uh, good behaviors from those on the call. Uh, we want to allow you to ask your question. Uh, and so you'll do that by hovering over the participants list. If you go and click on the participants list, which is at the bottom of your screen in that black bar, a box should pop up on the right side. And in there, you should have the option to raise your hand. And so you click a button to raise your hand as opposed to you raising your hand on the screen. Now, if my mother was on this call, she would not be able to figure this out. So it's okay if you actually raise your hand and we will try to make sure we see you. Um, we probably will have 80 plus on the call. So if we don't see you raise your hand uh, physically, it would be best if you could click the raise your hand button. So if some of you kind of want to play around with clicking that raise your hand button and shutting it off, that would be great. Uh, then we'll know that some people uh, know how to do that. So again, that's in the participants list. You click that, Mark looks good job, you raised your hand. Thank you, I saw that. Um, so kind of play around with that. That's the main way we're going to let you then uh, ask your question. So then we will unmute you. So right now you're all muted. We will unmute you and let you ask your question of the different panelists who I'll introduce here in a second. And let's say you can't figure that out and that's okay. You can use the chat box, which is at the bottom also. So if you click on the chat box across the bottom screen, you can click that and open that up and put a question in there. And we will also try to get that question answered. Now for those who are audio only, you don't have any of these functions because you're calling in from your cell phone. And so we will allow you to unmute your cell phone and go ahead uh, and ask your question. And so hopefully we just uh, don't talk all over each other. Um, because we're going to have a big crowd. Okay, great. So I um, am just really excited and humbled that everyone could join us today. And so from uh, the risk management uh, agency, Mark Gutierrez is going to help answer some of those crop insurance questions. Mike Henderson from NRCS down in the Des Moines office is going to answer some NRCS questions um, as far as you know what we have to think about with our EQIP or CSP contracts with cover crops, if that was in our plan and now we have crops on the ground. Susan Kozak from Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship is going to answer some of those other types of cost share questions and other just idle general support. Mark Licht from Iowa State is going to answer some of, you know, the crop damage questions, some maybe silage questions uh, that we might have. Um, we'll throw all the agronomy at Mark uh, if he wants to answer them. Um, and then Tim Bardol, a farmer from over in Greene County, is going to, you know, be on the phone to answer those questions from a farmer's perspective who, uh, who has also sustained some damage. He's also president of the Iowa Soybean Association, newly elected, and so he can go over some of those questions about just what he's thinking on his farm, um, what he's heard from other farmers, maybe from Iowa Soybean Association, um, and answer those questions. So I think with that, I think we've got most people in. Others might be joining us. This is also being recorded and we will send it back out to folks um, after the call. So with that, I'm gonna ask Tim to go ahead and unmute and uh, go ahead and tell us just a little bit, you know, what, what happened on your farm? Um, what damage have you sustained? Tell us a little bit about your background um, and set up some of the context for us. Yes, uh, <clears throat> a 
like like Sarah said, uh, we're in Greene County, which is uh, kind of the western edge of the where the first had the National Weather Service was saying there was 100 mile an hour winds. Uh, we have on the, <clears throat> the southern edge of the county where we farm, we had uh, a lot of hail with uh, what I would guess maybe at 80 mile an hour winds, which just totally destroyed uh, the corn and, and soybeans both. Then as it went north, uh, we have pretty much whole fields of flat corn. And then further north, uh, we have pockets of, of flat corn. Everything had some hail. So uh, for cover crop, the, the soybeans are no big deal how we deal with that. The flat corn is a big deal. Uh, we're also no-till, strip-till operation. We we haven't tilled anything since uh, 1993, and we don't plan to start now. So, you know, there's the issues with this blanket of, of corn out there, corn uh, stalks and leaves, and, and how, how we deal with that. How do we get cover crop to the ground? Um, how do we uh, go on next next spring getting ready to put a crop in with with this blanket of corn so there's definitely there's there's lots of issues that we're we're working on 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 top of everything we're also in the um, d3 drought, drought area which i think didn't didn't help us on our our corn standing and and the way our beans look but that's kind of a, a high view of of what i'm seeing out my window so sarah Great, thanks, Tim. Um, you know, and I'm just, we're all really sorry that all this has happened to so many farmers. Boy, and you were also in the drought area, um, which I know there's been a lot of cattle feed needs up in that drought area. Um, NRCS and FSA had released uh, CRP, access to graze and harvest CRP right before this happened because we were so low on feed for that drought area. Um, so this, I think, brings up a question mark Gutierrez that, um, you know, some farmers have been asking, what's the process? Let's, let's go over the process for crop insurance. Um, if we have a corn crop out there that's really damaged and we had insured it for grain, um, how, what are our next steps with just that? And then let's leave the silage question for a second after that. Okay. <clears throat> well, Probably, you know, the first steps if you have some damage from that storm um, is to notify your crop insurance agent, file a notice of loss. I always recommend people follow up in, with that in writing if you do it by phone. Try to follow up with a little letter or an email afterwards. And, um, you know, I know that there were some power issues and, and things like that. So if uh, somebody wasn't able to do that, it's, it's not going to be a huge deal if they couldn't do it right away. So I don't think people should stress about that either, as long as they do get that uh, notice of loss filed. Uh, from, from there, then uh, an adjuster will reach out and try to set up a time to come appraise the crop. And I, oh, that, that's one other thing I want to mention. If, uh, if you want to do something different with that crop, like try to take it for silage or try to plant cover crops and you, you're in a hurry to get it off of your field, it'd be a good idea to let your, your uh, insurance agent know that so that they can perhaps help move you to the front of the line um, a little bit. It's, it's tough because they're getting a lot of losses filed, obviously all at the same time, and they're having to call CAT teams in, uh, which are emergency adjuster teams who are ready to travel over and, and help assist with these big damaged areas. And, uh, but I think just if you can let them know, that will help. And so I'm just encouraging folks to do that if you're in a hurry for a second use. Uh, from, from there, once the adjuster comes out, there's, uh, you know, crop insurance doesn't really tell you what you have to do. So it's, it's up to, to you as the farmer to decide, do you want to you know, try to harvest the crop? Do you just want to take a total loss? Do you want to leave some representative samples? Um, you know, what's your next steps? And so working with your adjuster on that is, is kind of the next big thing. 
Okay, great. And so if a farmer then um, wants to go ahead and let's, let's do the scenario uh, that I saw yesterday on Twitter. Um, the farmer has had the adjuster come out and now the crop is released and the farmer is allowed to do with it what they want. Um, what's the process then for making that decision? I think this question would be maybe for Mark Lick. Let me go to Mark Lick. So let's say the crop is released and it's flat on the ground. Um, what are we thinking about how to manage all of that crop, crop residue that's on the ground after the crop has been released? So yeah, that's, that's a good question and we've maybe already um, we've maybe already seen um, some of that occurring um, out there. Um, I, I think in a large part, um, while I know um, th that we have no tillers and we have strip tillers that don't necessarily want to do um, some widespread tillage, but I think in some cases um, going in there with a disc or a vertical tillage or something to shred those stalks is going to be beneficial just to um, more or less size that residue, process that residue. Um, and then what that will also do is that will break open those husks and uh, hopefully um, we can get uh, some of that corn that's on those ears to uh, germinate um, this fall yet. Um, it, you know, and so I think that is the consideration is how do we, how do we process some of that residue? Um, because that will help as we get into the spring and we, we think about the, the next planting season. The other thing um, to kind of get thinking about now is, um, you know, one, how are we going to deal with a little bit more volunteer corn next year? So obviously the first steps are making sure we take note of the herbicide traits, um, if any, that this, uh, this corn crop had. Uh, we probably should be considering going into uh, soybeans next year following some of this um, more severely um, affected areas. Um, just because um, that, again, opens up some management on that um, volunteer corn management side of things. And then I, obviously, um, I do think um, we do have some opportunity here yet uh, for cover crops. Um, I think, again, processing and sizing some of that residue will allow better seed to soil contact, better light uh, penetration down to get that, that cover crop seed to germinate and emerge. Um, the, the bright thing, and I think this is one of the in my opinion, one of the bigger reasons why we should probably be considering um, a, a cereal rye cover crop is that um, we, in a large part of this area, we've been dry. Um, if we get rains next spring, we could see some nitrate flushing um, through the system. And so if we have some cover crops in place, um, that can help buffer and, and reduce that nitrate flushing. Great. Um, so <clears throat> let's say that we're Let's say that we're not used to doing tillage. Um, and so Mike Henderson, I'm wondering uh, from an NRCS perspective, any ATL issues. So this area that really got hit, most of it's non-ATL. I would overwhelmingly, this is not our higher ATL part of the state, uh, luckily. But I'm just wondering, Mike Henderson, if there's anything farmers need to be thinking about if they do you know, need to size that residue deal with it so that they can set themselves up for good conditions next spring. <clears throat> is there anything they need to think about with that with their NRCS office or FSA um, as far as like HEL ground where they're not normally doing uh, tillage but they have corn down on the ground? Any thoughts there Mike? Yeah that uh, absolutely they would need to come in to the uh, field office, work with the, uh, the staff, uh, review their conservation plan, make sure what uh, that does say. If they're looking at uh, going from a continuous corn or putting a soybeans in, uh, that does have implications uh, behind that. Uh, there's some options we can do in uh, some of those cases, uh, especially if they're looking at tillage, putting in a cover crop uh, behind that, uh, really getting that root mass back in there can, can help with that. Uh, but absolutely get in with the uh, field office and work with them early and uh, probably would be good to work with them prior to the uh, tillage or the uh, uh, decision uh, to move forward with the soybeans. So are you saying that, you know, a farmer that has ATL ground um, and they've had the crop released, so we're still talking about the period of time where the crop is released 
It's two on the ground to try to harvest. That's the scenario we're still in. If they needed to do tillage and they were HEL, if they came back with a cover crop right away, would they still be within HEL compliance, even if they had to do a tillage pass? Is that what you're saying? It would be a case by case basis. I mean, it's uh, the uh, farm bill, the HEL compliance and that is really based on um, the uh, soil types within any given field. And so it uh, really comes back to what uh, the planting soil is and how much uh, is allowed uh, within that. Um, but the cover crop is going to help uh, in, in, in the situation. Uh, so, I mean, we encourage cover crops on basically everything to get that uh, soil stability uh, and get the benefits. Uh, but within the HL compliance, uh, then it does uh, come into play. So I'm not saying that it's going to help and uh, solve all the issues. I'm just saying that uh, that is an option uh, that will uh, enhance it and help. Uh, and understanding this is uh, kind of an emergency situation. Um, it's an unusual situation. Um, working with the field office to do uh, long-term rotation or uh, looking at it a little bit uh, differently uh, with a one-time deal, uh, one-time tillage. Even though we don't like it, uh, you're really going to impact the soil health, the stability of the farm, the, the benefits of that no-till, strip-till. Um, understanding management of, is a big deal across many farmers, uh, and we need to understand that we need to work with the farmers on that management and those management decisions. So working with the field office, uh, and then they'll contact on up uh, to the area office and state office if they need assistance with uh, particular situations. But in, in the most case, like you said, uh, this area that was affected primarily uh, flatter, not quite as steep as slopes, even though there are some out there. Um, and it's amazing how that wind wrapped around those hills. So the hills didn't even real, really protect um, some of the corn that's down. Great. Thanks, Mike. So back to Tim, um, for some of your stuff that is down on the ground, stuff that you're not going to try to harvest and being that you're, you know, reduced tillage farmer, what are you thinking about how to deal with residue? Are you going to like harvest it at all or try to still go ahead and work it and come up with cover crop? Like, what are you thinking there? Um, <clears throat> we're thinking we're going to try to drill cover crops. Uh, into that down corn, trying to find a direction that so the drill will kind of cut up the corn and uh, be able to uh, get some some rye or, or something growing in there. So that's that's the plan. Uh, we'll see if if the plan works, I guess. Yeah. Um, I have heard of some other farmers. I think one of your neighbors actually was going to try to just go through it, um, I think, with vertical tillage and seed cover crops at the same time to see if he could uh, just cut it up a bit, uh, but not fully uh, uh, bury it. Uh, well, we will all be thinking about you when you do that exercise of drilling through that down corn um, and hope that that works really great because that's a good idea. Then you could have less tillage, uh, but also get that cover crop going. Okay, yep. so that would all be after that field has been released um, and we're sort of in this early window, like right now, you know, we've got corn down on the ground, it's unharvestable um, and the adjuster has come out and they've released it. Um, so talk to me, the mark, talk to me about uh, RMA perspective on harvesting that which was certified or um, I'm sorry, insured for grain, but harvesting it for silage. What's the RMA perspective on that? And then Mark Lick, what's the quality concerns uh, on harvesting that for, for silage? So Mark, would you as you go first? Okay. Uh, well, so one thing uh, I think uh, you have to consider when you, if you decide to do that is that um, if you harvest that silage, that will be a count as production. And that could then, uh, you know, change your, what your uh, indemnity could be and um, so that's just one thing one factor to consider when making that decision and I think you've talked to your again talk to your adjuster about that and just kind of make sure it's what you it's what you want to do and that you're you know it's something you need to do and make sense you can just kind of do the math quick and make sure it's going to balance out 
Um, but as far as the ability to do it, it's it's not a big deal. Let your adjuster know you want to do that when they release it, and then you'll be able to take that uh, and use it for silage. So if we were insured for grain and the adjuster comes out and then they release the crop, then and we want to take it for silage, um, we're good to go taking it for silage. Uh, as far as crop insurance is concerned, um, you will have so to. I'm sorry, sir. You will have to keep track of your production. If you think about it like that, especially if it's going to be for on-farm use. So just make sure you do keep your records. That's the only other thing I forgot to say. Okay, great. Okay, so Mark Lick, any what are our concerns about feeding some of this stuff? So. Um, Generally speaking, quality can still be pretty good in it. Um, if you think about it, a lot of this corn was um, late dough or early dent stage. So there is there is some good quality out there. Um, the first concern is you're, you're going to have to be moving on it fairly quickly. Um, some of this corn is drying down uh, much faster than we would have liked. Uh, just talked with a co-op agronomist who had been scouting some fields um, east of Ames here. Uh, and he said some of this is already um, at black layer or has progressed to black layer. A um, lot of variability within the fields. Um, so in some respects that may be able to help you from a silage harvest, uh, being able to manage the whole plant uh, moisture. Um, a couple of the concerns are the risks here, um, especially in the drought stricken areas. Um, there is the potential for higher nitrates uh, in this silage, especially if you're um, you know, dealing with some of the corn that's uh, much flatter uh, because that lower part of the this corn stalk, the lower third, has the highest amount of nitrates in it um, at this stage of the game. And so, um, yes, you can ensile it and if it gets ensiled properly, um, that will help reduce uh, nitrates by 40 to 50 percent or something in that ballpark. Um, and so if, if you're going to get a good ensile on it, um, it's probably best to uh, test it before you feed it. So let it ensile, um, then take a sample, test it, and then based on that test, you can determine how high that level is and how much you might need to mix, um, you know, other, other ingredients into that feed ration. So it is manageable, uh, but something, something to consider. Um, the other consideration here um, that we really have to be factoring in is that uh, this down corn um, is starting to get some ear molds into it. Um, those ear molds, um, if we catch them early enough, um, you know, and if we get things taken care of early enough, um, you know, may, may not have any impact at all, uh, but it does, the more we get, the more um, impact that does have on the quality of it. Um, obviously, if it stays out there and we get into the right conditions, uh, then we get into um, the concern for mycotoxins. Um, and again, um, especially uh, west of uh, I-35, um, because of the drought conditions, we start to think about um, Aspergillus flavus. Um, it's a olive green um, type of ear mold, but that is the ear mold that can um, uh, potentially turn into or produce aflatoxin. Um, and we have a, a much lower tolerance uh, for aflatoxin, especially if we're looking at uh, dairy or uh, cow-calf herds, things like that. So um, paying attention to what you have in the field and what you're thinking about, um, you know, as far as harvesting that and, and how you're processing or how you're ensiling that product. Um, the, the concern, and we've seen some of this with the large hail event uh, from 2009, um, the, the thought was, yeah, let's get some value out of this and, and make some silage. But if we didn't have silage bags, if we didn't have the, the bunkers or the, the silos, um, we were trying to pile in, we were trying to pack it, and it, and it did not produce very good silage at all. So making sure that you have the infrastructure, the capability to get it ensiled properly is going to be a, a high priority here. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so Susan, I wanted to just uh, bring you in uh, from IDOLS on some of the cost share opportunities right now. So, so let's say a farmer um, Again, we're still in this scenario of right now. So let's say a farmer had the adjuster out, the field got released, they either did some tillage or did the drill application of cover crops like Tim's thinking of doing or took it for silage. Um, and so the field is open. We have a good long window right now uh, for potential for nitrate loss uh, for sure and a lot of erosion if we don't get that uh, field covered up. 
And I'm just wondering from IDOL's perspective, um, what opportunities are there for farmers to take advantage of any cost share or any other programs uh, right now? So we're keeping a close eye on the demand and that's one thing we're trying to gauge right now is is there going to be increased demand for cover crops and funding um, if so we're prepared to shift some of our funds if we need to but right now we have our statewide sign up for water quality initiative so that can be for first time users of cover crops or previous users of cover crops and we still have money available in that um, pot of money we also have our traditional cost share money that can cover cover crops also, and we have money available in that. We will be doing um, supplemental funding out to the, the soil districts here in September. So it would be good for people to get into their field office and indicate that interest if they think that they're going to want to do cover crops, even if you're not sure what, what that looks like yet. Start having that conversation with the field offices so that we know if we need to get some supplemental cost share out there or ship some more funds to water quality initiative. Um, the other option that people could be looking at is we've had the cover crop crop insurance um, reduction with RMA where you can get $5 off per acre on your cover crop insurance if you plant cover crops. And we do subsidize that through IDOLS, the Department of Agriculture also. And we're looking at, will we need to put some more money into that fund this year also. So that's a potential, um, we're looking at all the different options to make sure there's plenty of funding available. And one other thing that really isn't the, the worry or concern right now, but I want people to be aware of is windbreaks also. We have heard some anecdotal stories where people had windbreaks at their farms and that really helped with um, preventing some of the damages to their houses. So windbreaks are an important thing you could be doing. We have funding through uh, REAP, the Resource Enhancement and Protection Program, that you could either plant new windbreaks or you can repair your old windbreaks uh, with some funding. So that's another thing that you could be talking to your field offices about. That's a great point. Boy, I was near windbreak near Newton this weekend, dropping off some food for some workers. And wow, that was a lot of work. Uh, lots of trees down. So uh, Wade Dooley has a question uh, and I'm going to ask him to unmute and maybe ask that question if you can. All right, you got me? Yeah, go ahead, Wade. Okay, so looking at all this down corn, I'm in northern Marshall County, so we got smacked pretty good. Uh, given that all of it was in a very green state, if we do any direct seeding into that, say we try and drag a drill across the field or we're gonna run in and uh, direct seed with a VT machine, we're cutting and sizing residue as we're putting seed in the ground, which generally was considered a good thing, but we're doing it into 200 plus bushel corn. So that's a lot of green material that's all gonna have to break down. Are we gonna run into issues with, as that breaks down, it goes into like a slime? and ends up negatively affecting that cover crop seeding because we've seen before dry residue can have an effect, but this isn't dry, this is green. And if it breaks down at the rate that I think it will in September, would we be looking at some major issues? Yeah, so I don't know the answer to this question. Um, Mark Lick, Tim, who, who's got a thought on this? I guess my one thought was about herbicides. Let me let me hit that really quick. So if we had any residual herbicides out there, especially since we've been dry, I could see potentially some herbicide injury uh, to the cover crop getting started. Although rye is very resistant, uh, but we have seen some issues with dual two magnum affecting rye. So if that if those things are still hanging around, I could see that being an issue. That's something that I actually know about science uh, an answer to. The other stuff, Mark Licht or Tim, any thoughts you're having with just all that residue out there and that affecting the cover crop seed as it's breaking down? So Mark, I'll, why don't you go first? I was gonna say, I'll, I'll give this a shot. Um, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest, Wade. I do not know um, how that um, decomposing corn residue is gonna affect it, um, affect that seed. Um, normally, or at least how I've been thinking about this thus far, um, is that 
trying to size that residue, I think will whether it's with the green drill or with a VT or a, a stock shredder or something like that, I think will help from the standpoint of getting better seed to soil contact with that cover crop, um, getting better light penetration down into that, uh, well, now um, size canopy, right? Um, I think um, trying to get one, the seed to get fallen through, you know, if you're broadcast seeding, falling through that down corn um, and then getting um, light penetration into it, it's gonna be very hard at this stage of the game. Um, and, and that's why I think sizing or shredding that residue can help um, with that process. Um, in some respects, um, the, the decomposing residue um, will also be, you know, it, I'll say forming a mat, um, helping conserve some moisture if we do get some. But, you know, as, as you're kind of going down the line, will that, help, will that also um, create problems in that? I don't know. Tim, any thoughts on your end? Um, I, I don't think it's going to, I don't foresee it being an issue. Um, especially with, with rye. It, rye is hard enough to kill when you're trying to kill it. Um, so I think rye would, would be able to handle it all right. There's some of the other cover crops, maybe, maybe not so much. The, the ones are a little harder to get going. Um, historically, we really uh, love turnips just because they, they germ so easy and get started uh well however uh we haven't decided if we're we're going to use that on the where we have the down corn just because um you're just kind of adding uh the turnip to the to the mix of everything else there so um i really think you know rise rise probably the best bet in the really tough down corn because it it, it can it can survive a lot and we'll get started and, and go good. So that's that's what I'm planning that's gonna happen anyway. So yeah, Jacob, one other thought, oh, Mark, go ahead. I was just gonna comment uh, that Jacob Bolson um, um, commented about uh, because we are on the early side of things, right? Um, we can maybe, you know, size and process that residue a little bit, wait a couple of weeks. Um, it's, a week like this is going to help, right? Um, where that residue is going to dry down pretty quickly. Um, and so then that would allow a little bit of time for that residue to naturally dry down um, and, and then come in, um, you know, early to mid September uh, timeframe to be able to seed it. And, th and that does make a lot of sense. Um, that leaf tissue will uh, dry out rather quickly. The stalks may be a little bit more um, uh, resilient and, and dry down more slowly. Um, but that would help um, from a, a biomass perspective and getting light down into um, that soil surface where the seed would be placed. Then, Mike Henderson, it looks like you had a question. I was just going to bring up, uh, I mean, when we have uh, the slime issues and uh, that is that uh, uh, biomass is degrading, think about uh, the uh, growth stage that the uh, crop is in. Uh, typically we're looking at uh, when we're talking slime, uh, a very, very heavy mat of uh, young rye uh, that we're putting down. Uh, this corn is uh, toward the later stages of its maturity. Uh, the stalk and the leaves do not have uh, near the moisture in them uh, that that young uh, growing rye plant does. Uh, and also allowing that biology, uh, if you're in a no-till or a strip-till uh, situation, or at long-term, uh, you've got a very good uh, robust uh, biology out there uh, be patient, uh, let that biology do some work uh, for you. Um, my personal opinion is I do not think we're going to see any slime issues or anything like that with the corn. If you can get good seed to soil contact with your cover crop uh, and get that um, enough moisture to get it going, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, a good product. Great. So keep those questions coming in. Okay, so let's now think about the scenario where we have corn that's maybe at a 45 degree angle, it's not completely snapped off. We're gonna probably try to take a combine through it and harvest it. Um, and so we were out um, last week at Tim Kauser's farm uh, north of Nevada 
because we wanted to see what could we do for aerial seeding into that downed corn. Um, and so I'm gonna share some of that. And then I wanted um, others on the panel to kind of think about, you know, what are our cover crop options for corn when we're gonna take that combine through it? Um, and maybe some post-harvest options. So results that we saw from aerial seeding uh, cover crops, we had Rantiso's drone, which holds about 15 pounds of cereal rye. It's, it's more uh, used for like turnips or small seeds, um, just because rye is such a fat uh, seed. So we had about 15 pounds of seed in the, in the drone and we uh, aerial applied about 20, about a million seeds per acre was our rate. So we had about 25 seeds on the ground in a square foot. Um, and that went over various types of downed damaged corn, some standing with just denuded leaves, some at a 45 degree angle, some um, about a foot off the ground, but completely lodged. And then a few uh, plants that were completely on the ground, like what Tim was discussing earlier. Um, and so to my surprise, uh, you know, where the leaves were denuded, the seed was to the ground, just like a normal aerial seeding application. Uh, so I thought that was uh, good. Uh, and I guess uh, that wasn't surprising. What was surprising was when the corn was at a 45 degree angle or a foot off the ground at like a 20 degree angle, um, we still had like 80% of the seed getting to the ground. And some of it was on top of the leaf uh, structure and then a large amount of it got to the ground, um, which I think is a good opportunity then to do aerial seeding. If we are intending to put a combine through that field um, and not take, uh, you know, that that crop off um, with silage or uh, needing to size that crop and get it into the ground because we're not going to use a combine. So where we're going to use a combine, I think we can aerial seed when that crop is not fully, fully, fully on the ground. Because when we did aerial seed and the crop was completely on the ground, the seeds were obviously sitting on top of the leaves. Um, and so that's probably not the scenario we want. Um, and so when I was discussing this uh, with another cover cropper and uh, Tim Kauser about seed selection, I was hesitant to put an oat cover crop uh, into corn that's lodged and like just a foot off the ground because oats are kind of aggressive in the fall. Um, but other farmers said that I shouldn't, shouldn't be worried about that, that taking a combine through oats that are standing with corn, no issues. Um, so Tim or Mark Licht or anyone else um, on the panel, what are your thoughts about the seed species selection if we were going to aerial seed into corn that we will combine? Well, I'll uh, say we've put cover crop on early to end, had winds through and had a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of growth, both um, with uh, corn and soybeans. And, you know, as far as, as the, the cover crop growth there, we've never had an issue. I, I don't, I don't see an issue um, for the either for the the harvesting or um, really for hurting the cover crop either one so I I don't think that's that's a concern okay Mark, the, only, the only thing I would be concerned about is if if seeding gets done too far ahead and I'm, what I'm thinking of is being able to see the row being able to move you know through the fields um, that obviously is a little bit easier where we have auto steer and we have the, the finger sensors on the heads. Um, but if, if you do get too much vertical growth, um, that can make, you know, harvesting this down corn uh, a little bit uh, harder. But again, I, I don't think the combine is going to have any problem processing. It's just a matter of um, can, you, can you see your rows well enough yet? And, and that's already going to be a problem. So um, that would be my only concern with it. Um, I, you know, from that standpoint. And Tim, it looks what, like you're, before you, Mike, Tim, it looks like you were going to say something. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I was going to say uh, um, related to what he just said was cover crop in corn never, it really doesn't ever come right at, at along the row because of the, the root mass of the corn. So it, I, I, I understand his point, but on the other hand, if, if you have good green in the middle, it might help you see where you're going combining. Mike, what were you going to offer? That, uh, I mean, we're talking about uh, whether we put a brassica in uh, or not. 
Uh, if we're looking at residue uh, management, uh, the brassica is uh, as that grows and then starts to uh, uh, to decompose, especially in the spring, you're going to get an accelerated uh, decomposition of the uh, the residue. And I consider that this uh, the amount of residue we have out there is a normal corn crop. So sizing and uh, uh, processing it, uh, if that leaf is on the ground, uh, that biology is going to uh, really attack that very aggressively because that leaf is a little bit greener, uh, has uh, more nutrient in it uh, right now. Uh, so patience in, uh, in, in working through this, I think, uh, is really good. And it, it, it's really going to show uh, what fields have the, the biology ramped up and ready to digest that uh, residue. Uh, but again, I mean, that brassica, those uh, kales, uh, turnips, uh, rapes are really going to uh, enhance the decomposition, especially in the spring. Tim's, Tim's point about, and the brassicas would really help see the row. Tim's point about being able to actually see the row because of the green um, is interesting uh, for maybe helping with harvest that I hadn't thought about. Uh, so Wade offers partial, partially lodged corn may actually help the cover establish with moisture retention. Um, so any thoughts there on, on helping those cover crops get established that we would be overseeding because of the, the conditions? Any thoughts there? Just May, we'll see. Mike, thoughts? I guess, uh, I mean, the main thing to think about when you're putting anything in the ground, I mean, any seed, uh, you've, you've got to have seed to soil contact, uh, and then you've got to have moisture. Uh, in the first uh, 10 days to two weeks, uh, that's what's critical. So if that seed's laying on top of a corn leaf or soybean leaf, uh, it's not going to be able to get the root into the ground. Um, once you get uh, past that 10 days, two weeks, you really need to start getting the sunlight into it. Uh, and so uh, thinking about that in when you place it out there, how you pl place it out there, uh, a lot of these fields are gonna be a field by field basis. Walk out in the field, uh, do the assessment, how many leaves are actually flat on the ground that'll prevent that seed from getting to the ground. Great. Um, so, okay, so we're in the scenario where we've had the adjuster come out. Um, we're thinking of taking it through the combine. We're going to harvest that crop. Uh, we may have thought about Ariel applying the seed. <clears throat> Mark uh, from RMA, what are any uh, red flags from our discussion about cover crops that you hear? It seems to me that the cover crop probably isn't going to impede harvest, um, like that I was a little bit paranoid about. So, Mark, uh, from RMA, any thoughts on things farmers might need to just think about before they would put that cover crop into that standing corn that they're going to plan to take a combine through? I can't think of any red flags from anything I've heard so far. Uh, I think just like you mentioned, as long as they are able to harvest that crop, or as long as the cover crop doesn't impede the harvest, uh, they should be fine. Yeah, at this point, the, what I what I believe I've heard is the growth stage is far enough where it's definitely not going to impede that. So uh, it seems like it would be uh, allowable under uh, crop insurance to, to to do that practice. Great. Okay. So we're basically business as usual, um, as long as that cover crop doesn't get too crazy uh, and impede harvest. But to to Tim's point, um, you know that the sunlight is going to be held back he's still going to be holding back that cover crop as if we were aerial seeding, um, you know, in the places where we just have the lodged corn. Okay. So now let's think about, um, we've, we've taken the combine through, we didn't aerial seed uh, cause we didn't want to uh, want to do that. And now we want to do a late fall cover crop uh, post harvest. We got through all that corn. We are still committed to cover crops, even though that was like an awful amount of harvesting. Um, and it's not Thanksgiving yet. Uh, so we're going to try early November uh, to get through there. And so Wade's question, um, Wade, I'll just ask it so you don't have to unmute. You know, if there is increased decomposition of that corn um, while we're taking the combine through, and then maybe that residue that's on the ground is breaking down at the same time pretty quickly, does that increase the need for a cover crop to control erosion through this winter um, or, you know, what we get from uh, water erosion next spring? So uh, maybe Mike Henderson, you want to take that first and then maybe Susan, 
um, from IDELS, why don't you jump in uh, on this, this question here and what IDELS could provide? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. Uh, anytime uh, you have exposed uh, soil surface, uh, exposed to the, the elements, uh, you increase damage to that soil surface. Uh, so keeping a uh, protective cover on that, whether it be residue, uh, if that's breaking down, getting that uh, cover crop in there uh, not only provides the uh, support uh, above ground to protect that uh, soil surface, it also does uh, uh, below ground. Uh, so from, from that standpoint, yes, encourage at any point in time to try to get uh, and keep cover out there on the ground. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, from the IDOL's perspective, we're always encouraging people to have cover crops on their um, ground. It's just so important to have something green and growing out there to help reduce the nutrients, but then also protect that soil. Uh, we, that's our biggest mission is soil conservation. Um, but I think it's important to know that there's many different programs and ways to do it. So if somebody is new to the cover crop game, get into your USDA field office and ask for some advice. Uh, they're going to help you find the right program, the right cost share for you to uh, help with your situation. Yeah. Great. Just, so I'll uh, read just a note on that, uh, uh, with the uh, COVID protocol that we still have, a lot of our offices are uh, still taking appointments, uh, need to phone call in, uh, talk to them, uh, make sure that they're knowing you're coming in, they come out to the field, visit with you out there. Um, but just a little bit tougher uh, to get in. Uh, do want to mention that, I mean, the, the from the federal programs, uh, it is a continuous sign up. So at any point in time that you're interested or want to talk about cover crops, uh, good to get in, talk to the field office uh, or, or call them, uh, get them out, talk to them, uh, get an application signed. Uh, the application doesn't obligate you to anything. It obligates the field office to process it uh, and uh, communicate with you. Great. Okay, we've got some questions rolling in. So Raymond, I will take your question after I read Brian Voss's. So just pre be prepared to unmute yourself. So Brian asks, if corn is not being harvested, will a stock chopper or roller crimper be effective to terminate the crop and control the residue? Maybe I'll shoot this one to Mark Lick first. So we use a roller crimper to mess with that residue. Oh, um, I hadn't thought about a roller crimper. Um, so yeah, a roller crimper works really good on, you know, the cereal grains as far as terminating them in the spring, right? Um, I suppose the weight of a roller crimper um, could be beneficial to, to, so to speak, squish the residue down, you know, against the soil surface, may um, um, crack that stalk, so to speak. Um, so that that could possibly be a benefit. Um, I think you're, the challenge that I'll see there is um, you may still have some wrapping, you know, with that residue in the spring going through a, a planter, especially if you're you're not running um, um, residue uh, cleaners off the row, or if you're uh, double disc openers, if they're not uh, properly set or uh, sharp enough. So you could have some some issues with the planter that way, just because that that corn stalk is still relatively intact. Um, I do like the idea of a stalk chopper. Um, now this goes back um, 20 plus years ago. I have seen a stalk chopper go through uh, green corn. Um, it does work, um, but it it is a little bit slower. You can't go nearly as as quickly as you would if it was uh, something that you know had been harvested uh, normally. Great, Mike Henderson. I was just going to add in a field uh, just north of my place. Uh, they did actually take a roller crimper out there, uh, and it was uh, very, very effective at uh, terminating the corn. Uh, it was a uh, seed corn field, uh, and so it had no crop insurance or that uh, decision. And it was within two days after the storm they had it rolled and uh, terminated effectively. Uh, and the thing uh, to think about on the uh, residue. Uh, on a stock chopper, you're going to uh, size that up uh, and, and put a pretty dense mat on the uh, soil surface, uh, which then will uh, uh, protect the moisture uh, for this uh, fall, 
uh, but potentially we have seen some issues in the spring if that dense mat stays out there, if your biology isn't uh, fully up to speed uh, in preventing that soil to dry out if we do hit a wet spring. Well, and, and the other part about, you know, sizing a residue of any kind, um, we've all seen um, the piles of corn stalks in ditches and along uh, fence rows. Um, so that could be a concern there too, you know, just to be careful that uh, we, we really do want the, the residue to be intact and, and stay in place rather than uh, blowing off the field. All right, Ray, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask sure. a question. Sure, thanks, Sarah. And, and, and you know that on our farm, we, we have, we're not in the direct area and I feel for you all, but, but on our farm, you know, for the last five years, uh, we've been following our combine, just spreading cereal rye about a bushel an acre. And uh, we've done it on 1,000 to 1,500 acres every year. Uh, and it has worked excellent, excellently and we've gotten a stand every year. You know, it, it has rained. But I, you know, in my mind, you could go into that down corn and just spread it. And then I do think that you're gonna need to roll a crippet or, or do some kind of vertical tillage just to get those ears on the ground, you know, and get them to sprout uh, and, and probably you know, get it um, workable for planting next spring. Uh, but, um, you know, for us, just spreading rye has really worked good and, and we're in southwest Iowa so we're uh, you know um, 70 80 miles south of you all that had the had the bad uh, bad weather but I, just a thought I do think you're gonna have to get some way to have those ears break down if you're not gonna harvest thanks yeah thanks Ray and Ray brings up a point um maybe we can troubleshoot this really quick and others get your questions uh in the chat box or raise your hand because we only have seven minutes left okay so let's say we are taking that crop to harvest and we're going to combine it we're probably going to have ears on the ground uh that probably aren't going to sprout this fall if it's November and we've got soil that is cold but we've got viable seed out there what are we thinking about volunteer corn management next spring I think a cover crop is uh, an obvious uh, tool in our toolbox for that. Um, but let's say we don't want to do cover crops for some reason. What are we going to do with volunteer corn management next spring going into soybeans? I will let and let's have Tim uh, go first and then Mark Lick. What are you thinking about, Tim? Uh, volunteer corn and soybeans uh, we can deal with. It's it's not a big deal. Uh, we, we deal with it every year. Now this next year is going to be, um, definitely there's going to be a lot more, but it, it's easy with herbicides to, to take care of that volunteer corn and in soybeans. Um, up in this area, we've got so many ethanol plants. Uh, there's, we're really, everybody's strong on corn. So the big change for, for us, instead of being, um, maybe 70, 65, 70% corn. Uh, next year, we're gonna be 65, 70% soybeans, which um, has been a little rough on, on, on making profits on soybeans the last few years. So uh, hopefully that changes. I, I do think there's gonna be a lot more soybeans grown uh, just because of this storm. And uh, with, with the genetics, at least that we plant, it's impossible to come back with with corn following corn after an event like this. I, I, agree, no. completely. Mark, I, I agree completely with Tim. Um, I think uh, continuous corn um, or corn following corn in these situations, I think it's going to be really, really tough um, just because you have very, very few options um, to manage that volunteer corn. Um, so soybeans will make that management a lot easier. It's still going to require knowing what traits that corn had and uh, managing it or making sure you have compatible traits um, for the, the chemistries you want. And uh, again, this is this should really be a minor issue because um, quite honestly, we have six months here to, to plan out what, what herbicide traits we're going to put in the soybeans. We have six months to figure out what that new herbicide potentially looks like. Um, I would say, and Sarah, I, I, I agree with you. I think um, having a cover crop out there can help us 
manage that corn, that volunteer corn to a certain extent. Um, uh, and I say that only from anecdotal evidence, uh, you know, driving around my, my home neighborhood um, where we, fields that did not have that cover crop had more volunteer corn earlier. Um, but um, one field that I've been, uh, I, I like to watch because it's, it's uh, always a lot of interesting things going on there. Um, he terminated the rye at soybean planting, but then he had a flush of uh, volunteer corn come up out after that. And so my, my point there is think about that post soybean um, herbicide application, uh, making sure that you have something in mind to help um, with you know, a later flush of that volunteer corn uh, emerging. Now, I'd like to bring up just a, a, a different viewpoint on that volunteer corn. Uh, just like I said before, the uh, seed to soil contact is uh, critical to really get that uh, uh, anything to grow. Uh, if we keep that ear up on top of the ground, keep it in the husk, uh, there is a potential. And uh, Minnesota has shown that uh, increased predation, increased uh, degradation of that seed over the winter uh, and potentially can have le reduced volunteer corn because that uh, ear is intact and above uh, uh, the ground uh, in that. Uh, and, and, and considering at the time that this uh, corn was damaged, I mean, uh, late dough, early dent, uh, yes, that seed's going to be viable from a germination standpoint, but it is going to be less uh, uh, ag less aggressive. Uh, it, it's going to degrade faster. Uh, the germination is going to go away quicker. Great. So I think we have just about time for one more question. I'll ask one, and then if there's any last-minute hands uh, raised, go ahead and get those in. So what are we thinking about planter adjustments uh, next spring for residue? Let's say that both scenarios, <clears throat> Tim's scenario where maybe there's not a ton of sizing of that residue because we're going to put that drill through it and use the drill to size the residue. Um, what would we think about for planter setup there uh, versus where we've, you know, worked the ground? Um, that I think is probably business as usual planter adjustments. So what about where we have this like medium area where we kind of have some sized residue, but not really? What should our planter adjustment setups, what should we be thinking about? Mark Licht, I'm gonna have you answer that. I actually want to, to defer to Tim, um, or even, okay. even if we have another participant, just because I, I, I know the agronomics, but I'm not necessarily an equipment guy. Um, what we would do since uh, we have uh, John Deere 750 drills that uh, we've used for a long time and, and they can they haven't let me down yet on no, anything I've tried to do with them, even things that seemed a little um, odd. Uh, if if there's a lot of residue and I don't think we can get through with a planner with residue managers, if it's just not cut up enough and if we have trouble, we'll drill it. But um, any more of the planners, uh, boy, you can do a lot with them to just set in the residue managers, maybe a little more aggressive than, than you normally would uh, lots of times. Uh, we just won't use them in soybeans, uh, planting soybeans into corn stalks, and we might just adjust depth a little bit. Um, but the, the planters do real well anymore, and uh, there's always the option of, of, for us for drilling. But I, I think our planter would make it through after it's wintered, and if we get it starting to decompose some, we're so dry. Uh, I'm a little worried about that side of it. Um, we've had four inches since the first of April. Um, in the northern part of the county where my son lives, he's had just over three inches since the first of April. So I'm concerned about the the earthworms. Usually this time of year, the earthworms will be pulling uh, leaves down into their holes, trying to you know just have some deep. But I'm afraid the earthworms are probably pretty deep because we're so dry on top. So. That is a concern, but I think I think we'll be able to get it planted after the winter. Great. Well, I'm going to cut you, uh, Mark and Mike, off because uh, we're at time. Uh, there are two questions that did come in from the chat box, and we will note those down and send a follow-up email answers to those. 
So I just, I really want to thank everybody who joined today. Thank Tim, Mark, Mike, Mark, and Susan uh, for offering uh, really good information for everybody on the call. Um, and don't forget those who are new to cover crops or those who have done it before. Um, we have opportunities for cost share from NRCS for my dolls. And then don't forget about Practical Farmers of Iowa uh, cost share that we run um, with soybeans that are sold into the ADM supply chain and then corn that would be sold into the Eddyville supply chain. Um, and so if you're looking for more information on that, you can contact me, Sarah, at practicalfarmers.org. And we will send uh, this webinar out also to those. Um, and thanks, everybody, and good luck, um, Tim. Good luck uh, with trying out these uh, new things uh, this fall. So thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. <laughs>